The agenda this week debriefed Ontario's 2020 budget, debated Queen's University's decision to drop John A. Macdonald's name from its law school, learned how charities are coping through this pandemic, and heard from Hamilton's legendary glam punk band, Teenage Head. The agenda's week in review begins with what a contested U.S. presidential election means to the rest of the world. Here's a point that I think we don't make often enough. Trump believes that since he appointed three justices to the Supreme Court, he will get the support of that court. And that's actually helpful that he believes that, although I don't agree with him. Uh, the three justices that he appointed are all social conservatives, you know, defined by their opposition to abortion and minority rights and LGBTQ rights, and not to minimize the seriousness of those, of those kinds of views. Nevertheless, these judges are constitutionalists. And more than that, some of them are what in the United States lexicon are called originalists. Uh, where the Constitution mm -hmm. ranks wholly. I have great confidence that if it comes to any kind of conflict between this president and the fundamental values of democratic practice and democratic process, the court will not support him. And it will make him very, very difficult for the Trumpists and the Trump campaign to take to the streets when justices that were appointed by Trump and a court shaped by Trump um, do not support the president in these kinds of challenges. So we are a long, long, long way from violence, both in time. This process is going to drag on in an excruciating way, but more important, um, in practice. But Janice, I can easily imagine, and I bet you can too, if, for example, this gets to the Supreme Court, and the court goes against the current president and says there have been no violations of the law here. Sorry, you lost. You got to go. It mm -hmm. wouldn't surprise me at all to see him up at a podium in front of 5,000 people somewhere saying, and I put these people on the court and look how they've deceived me. Look how they've betrayed me. And then so, ginning up the whole thing all over again. What do you do then? Steve, I don't believe that's credible. Don't forget, a very short while ago, he was standing in the Rose Garden celebrating his latest uh, appointee as an outstanding person. He's put a third of the members, uh, a third of the judges on this court. He cannot now turn around and say these people are illegitimate and they cheated him in the election. It won't, even, it won't be believable. Well, uh, Timothy Gartnash, you wrote this just a few days ago. You said, quote, democracies everywhere must prepare for the contingency of a contested result. How do they do that? So, uh, not like we did in 2000, where we were all over the place. And, for example, the German president congratulated George W. Bush and then withdrew his congratulations and then had to restore them weeks later. So I think it's really important that all the democracies in the world, countries like Canada, Britain, Germany, Australia, um, have a similar position, which is keep calm, watch carefully, and wait to see how that process Janice has just described is played out. And I'm actually with her that if it goes to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court rules against him, I think senior Republicans at that point will also say to him, you've got to go with it. Mm -hmm. um, can I make a broader point, Steve, which is, you know, we are in the midst of a global democratic recession. Mm -hmm. This is the first year since 2000 that there are um, less um, democracies in the world than there are non-democracies. Now, it's already clear that the United States is not going to be able to lead the great renewal, worldwide renewal of democracy, because that would have needed an unambiguous landslide victory for Biden and getting the Senate, OK? So that means it's actually more up to us, more up to countries like Canada and Britain and the EU and Australia and so on, A, to do the domestic renewal of liberalism, broadly conceived, to win back those voters who've gone to the populist nationalists, but also to lead, so to speak, the international renewal of liberal democracy. Because I'm afraid, from what we used to call um, the leader of the free world, 
we're not going to get that leadership in the next four years, even if it's President Biden. Well, that's a fair point, Seven. Now, you know, back in the day, we always used to think that it, we counted on the Americans to lead, to be that shining city on a hill uh, and lead the world towards more democracy. That, that, that's not going to, that certainly hasn't been the case the last four years and may not be for the next four either. To what extent do you think the rest of the democratic world can, can lead that effort uh, in the absence of a strong America? Well, let me back up historically. If we look at the spread of democracy over the past century, we see these waves of democratic uh, transformations that happen after global disruptions. They happen after World War I, after World War II, after the Soviet collapse. After all these shocks, we see democratic waves uh, that sweep uh, entire regions. But in all three of those crises, the U.S. emerged as the winner, right? It showed that it could survive and triumph in a crisis. That has not been the case in this crisis, as we've already mentioned. The U.S. has not shown itself to be a model worthy of emulation. And I think that's really America's most important contribution to global democracy, not its efforts at democracy promotion, which have often been clumsy and hypocritical, but through its status as a success story, as a democracy that works for its people, as a, as a model worthy of emulation and, and a side worth joining too. Uh, and a lot of that appeal, and with it the appeal of democracy, is tarnished regardless of what happens in the next few days. Now, it's not like China or Russia have come up with better answers so far, and the U.S. certainly does not have a monopoly on what democracy represents. Uh, but to the extent that fewer people are looking at the U.S. and saying, I'd like to live there, I'd like to study there, and if I can't do that, I'd like to live like that. To the extent that fewer people are saying this, then the lesser the appeal for democracy around the world, regardless of what other democratic states do. The province of Ontario is supposed to, you actually are supposed to by law, lay out a path to get us back to a balanced budget in each year's budget. You are, you are proposing to pass a little exemption to that this year, saying we're not going to do that. How come? Well, you know, the uncertainty right now makes it very, very difficult for the reason I just talked about. We've got record volatility from private sector forecasters as well uh, from all of the forecasters that the government uses. So we will try to path our, pass our path to balance and do that when we get to March uh, and the March budget. But right now, quite frankly, Steve, it's just very, very difficult. What we did think was important, though, was to have a multi-year budget. We're the first major jurisdiction to do that. To be fair, Quebec is going to follow us. I think it's uh, next week. Eric Girard, their finance minister, as well. It's important for us to move from what was a one-year plan that we launched back in March. You'll remember we were the first government to come out and put out a plan and put out forecasts. We updated those forecasts uh, at the end of the first quarter in August. This now gives a three-year perspective, and we hope that we're going to be able to go further in the next budget. But, but right now, the uncertainty is quite high. We want to have as much transparency as we can. And as you know, every quarter, I, I get up in front of the, the media and the public, and I update on how we're doing. You are a progressive conservative finance minister. And I know that when you got the job, you did not plan to bring in the biggest deficit by far in the history of the province of Ontario. How comfortable are you having to sign your name to a $38.5 billion net cash requirement this year? Well, you know, we were on track, as you know, to, to balance the budget in 22-23. In, uh, uh, we'd made some good progress in that direction. But, but Steve, everything changed with COVID-19. I mean, this, as I've said, and I said in my speech today, is the challenge of our generation, and, and it requires resources to make sure that we have the dollars. And I'm sure we'll talk about it, the dollars we're spending in health care and education, uh, in long-term care going forward and today. Um, so, you know, I feel just fine about it. I, I would, you know, rather we weren't in a global pandemic Pandemic, but we are, and faced with that, I think the only thing that's responsible to do is make sure that you know, were spending. Uh, Mike Schreiner, I can imagine the folks over at the Frost Block, where the Ministry of Finance is, saying, well, wait a second, we are spending a record amount of money in the province of Ontario in this budget. We are going into deficit with a record sizable deficit as well. I mean, we're kind of, you know, we're damning the torpedoes here and really going full throttle, and yet, we hear three critics saying that they haven't spent nearly enough. Any lack of, uh, or any discomfort on your part urging the government to spend so much more than they already have? 
you know, Steve, right now we're in an unprecedented health crisis and economic crisis. The only way we're going to get out of it is to put to make the kinds of investments, one, to control the virus. What's good for public health is going to be good for the economy. And then secondly, we have to make the investments to have a strong economic recovery. If you look at the three scenarios the government put out, the one that um, if we hit, which shows economic growth, that's the one that will actually ultimately lead to lower deficits. But if we don't make the investments now, we're not going to get there. And I can tell you as a small business owner, it's very common for businesses to borrow money or access a line of credit to make investments that they know are going to have a high rate of return on that, that investment. And right now is the time for Ontario to do that. Get this virus under control support those small businesses that have been forced to shut down, and then make sure we invest in building back smarter, which is exactly why I've been calling for a green and caring economic recovery for Ontario so that we invest in the emerging markets and create the jobs of the 21st century coming out of COVID. Don't you imagine, though, Sandy Shaw, that those, those medium and larger businesses in Hamilton will really appreciate the 14, 15, 16 percent break they're about to get in their electricity rates? Well, they may appreciate it. It really is important that we have a competitive hydro rate, but it ne needs to be pointed out that this government uh, who promised to fix the hydro mess has really just made it messier, in my opinion, and they are subsidizing hydro rates to the tune of about $6 billion a year. So take that out of the, the spending that you, you think is going to COVID relief and supporting uh, the, the hydro. And, you know, there's nothing in here for for residents. I mean, I hear from my residents all the time, and it's so true. They're struggling to pay their, their bills. They're struggling to pay their rent. And now uh, their hydro bills are going up. And so they get to pay for hydro twice. They get to pay for it now um, on their on their the, on their tax base. And then they get to pay it on their increases in their, their hydro bills. So while we need to have a competitive um, hydro, there, this government has done nothing to address uh, the, the, the real fundamental problem that we have in hydro and hydro rates in Ontario. I do want to ask Mitzi Hunter about that, though, because, you know, you're a former junior finance minister and you would have well recognized when you had that uh, role how important it is to have competitive electricity prices in the province. The Ford government now believes that it's made our electricity rates for big and medium sized businesses much more competitive, allowing them to be more profitable and hire more people. Is that not a good move? Well, let's see how that pans out. It is a costly move, that is for sure, moving costs off of the rate base onto the tax base. And, and $6 billion is a lot of funding that could be going into hospitals and education and into retraining that is going to be needed um, for, for those uh, businesses to have the skilled workforce that they need. So I do think it's important that government um, picks the lane that it wants to be in to support uh, citizens and to support our economy. This government clearly has done that um, by focusing on, on making hydro rates uh, lower, but there is a cost and someone's paying for that and, that, and those are Ontario's taxpayers. I'm going to ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring up those numbers right now because you asked the question, do you believe that the law school building should continue to be named Sir John A. Macdonald Hall? You surveyed nearly 3,000 people and yes, keep the name as is, came back with 47% support. No, drop the name, was it just a touch over 50% support? Then you surveyed law school alumni who answered the survey, yes, keep the name, 44%. No, drop the name, 38%. But of the current law school students, yes, keep the name, only 21%. No, drop the name, 58%. So the question is, how useful, uh, Mark, was all of that information to the university making its ultimate decision. Right. So, uh, you know, I think we all appreciated going into this, that there, this was a question that would divide people. Um, and it came out as dividing people almost down the middle. Um, though, as you just noted, law school alumni tended to favor keeping the name. Now, this was a, an interesting fact in in how we uh, we understood the responses it, it seemed that uh, uh, the graduates up to about the year 2000 tended to favor keeping the name and then thereafter tended to favor removing the name so there seemed to be a generational divide here and then we turned to present students but also faculty member and staff within the law school uh, an overwhelming majority tended to, to want to dename the building 
Um, and and uh, you know, in the end, your question: How do you uh, reach a conclusion on the basis of those numbers? You know, in the it really wasn't a matter of numbers. Uh, it's not just a matter of tallying up votes on one side or the other, but coming to a reasoned decision on the basis of principle. And um, so that's how we approached it in the end. Melanie Newton, what's your view of what the university has decided to do? Um, I think it reflects uh, the changing sentiment about the role that um, this kind of naming process and monuments and street names play, that it's not changing these names is not, quote unquote, changing history. It is acknowledging that history in a fuller and richer way. And that the naming, choosing to name something after John A. Macdonald is um, to choose to constantly reenact the fact that he was such a crucial figure in the history of residential schools. Jeffrey Simpson, before I get you to weigh in on what you think of the decision, maybe you could just tell us off the top, you do have a rather deep connection to Queen's University, do you not? I have. What is it? So I've been involved in Queen's for the better part of 50 years in different iterations, and it breaks my heart to see what they've done because um, this is what I call presentism. You can use other phrases. Presentism is where you have a certain view of society today and how it should be organized, and how it should have values that you agree with. And you project back 100, 150 years and say, why didn't they act then as we would act today? This distorts history completely. Put it another way, Steve, we're having a discussion today, November 2020, we all have worked for or worked at certain institutions. We don't spend any time nor can we spend any time thinking about what 150 years from now people will think about what we did today. Maybe the next generation, but not five or six generations from now. It's impossible to know what Canada will be like, what the world will be like 150 years from now. When there is not a global pandemic happening, we're going to share some numbers now with what life is normally like for organizations such as yours. This according to the Ontario Nonprofit Network. Last year, there were 58,000 nonprofits and charitable organizations in the province of Ontario. And of course, TVO is one of them. They employ a million people. They've got $50 billion worth of economic impact and their 5 million volunteers help them with services. They receive less than half of their revenue from all levels of government combined. So with all of that at stake, I guess the next question we have is, <laughs> we're not living in normal times now, so we really want to get a better understanding of what COVID-19 has done to your ability to do what you normally do. Helen, go ahead. Well, the easiest breakdown is that over the course of April to August, our associate lost close to $4 million in revenue, which is over about 20% of the typical annual revenue that we would receive. So as you can imagine, as a charity for tight margins. Um, that is very for us to sustain and it's certainly in a very precarious position. Paul, what's COVID-19 done to you guys? Yeah, yeah, okay. The first thing I would say is, you know, we've had seen significant impact. We're in a tricky position in that we operate a social enterprise that generates revenues to support some of our work. You know, we have this thing called the Good Food Box uh, where we sell boxes of fresh produce that we deliver to people's homes across the city. Uh, we also sell produce in bulk, largely to schools. And for us, that's our largest revenue generator. We're talking about thirty-five to forty thousand dollars a week during the school year, or, or close to one and a half million dollars. So once the pandemic hit, that revenue disappeared completely, and the, it's also causing us to have to cancel our annual fundraiser in 2021. It's our largest fundraiser of the year, something that we call Recipe for Change. Well, when we had our annual fundraising gala canceled, because, of course, you can't gather in, in groups of two or 300 anymore, uh, we simply did it on TV and still managed to raise some money. That was a good option for a TV station, but <laughs> you're not in the TV business. So how, how, do you, how do you rethink what you do if you can't do a gala? You know, this is the big thing, and I think lots of organizations have pivoted to doing things online. But we have to remember not everyone has stable and consistent access to the Internet. So, yeah, and we also, you know, I'm seeing a lot of nonprofits shift uh, galas and events to online, but, and, and the, the, it's, it's a really saturated place at the moment. I think everyone is trying to rethink how to generate that revenue. So we've decided we're going to take a step back. 
um, and look at uh, what we can do outside of bringing people to a, to a screen. Bruce, what are you guys uh, seeing in terms of the impact of COVID-19? Well, it's widespread. It's hitting every part of our sector. Uh, we had gone out and asked sector leaders the impact to their organizations uh, in the spring. And already in April, 30% of organizational leaders had laid off staff. Another 55% were saying that uh, future cuts were a possibility. You compare that to the 08, 09 economic collapse, only 23% actually laid off staff. So you can see that this pandemic is widespread and much deeper. Helen, we know that the issues and the problems, the uh, challenges that Northern Ontario poses are different from those that uh, we experience here in the South. So how are, how are you encountering COVID-19 challenges, say, differently than other charitable organizations south of the French River? Well, I'm not sure that there is all, all that much that's different. The challenges are the same. We probably have some advice with our geography in the sense that uh, the number of COVID cases aren't um, as high up here in the north. However, the impact in terms of making sure that we have um, additional protocols in place, which includes additional costs for personal protective equipment, et cetera, et cetera, are all, um, you know, they're as taxing as they need to be, but they certainly do cost organizations like ours more, mon more money. I would also echo the point that Paul made that as we have tried to move a number of our programs and services to virtual world, that is great in the sense that we've been able to pivot very quickly, but um, you know, certainly here in the North, access to the internet is not either reliable or widely available for everybody. And then in addition, a number of the, the vulnerable sections of our society that we are trying to do to support on the basis, but certainly with more emphasis during the pandemic, um, don't often have access to uh, the devices. As I alluded to in the introduction, this is not just a documentary about a group of guys that decide to get together and play music. There are so many more um, deeply felt universal themes that go throughout this documentary because of course you guys got you got a terrible blow dealt you in 2008 when your lead singer Frankie Venom Frank Kerr uh, died of cancer and the band stopped playing for a very very long time and I do want to touch on this here Doug maybe you could start us off on this as you tried to put this story together what did you see in terms of what Frank's death did to this group of guys well I saw the death of Frank as the beginning of the ghost of Frank that um, I think, um, you know, in the film we talk about Gord before and after the death of Frank. Um, and I think that when when you crystallize something as potent as as what what happened with these guys and it and it happens as far back as high school, uh, and then that becomes a friendship and it's a creative relationship like that um, and it evolves over time and then one day it's gone. Um, I, I think that um, there, you know, you know, that has really been a struggle for Gord and um, the film, the film tries to set up what, what then becomes the ghost of Frankie, you know, right up until right up until now. I mean, you asked Gord about it. Um, and uh, I think it, what was interesting was the very first shoot happens, we call it the Warner Sessions, and Gord has found tapes from 20 years ago in his closet. And they go, they go into the studio for the first time since the death of Frank, and Gord hears the songs again and encounters them. And he says, these songs remind me of old friends. Uh, they remind me of Frank. I think about him every day. Um, I miss him a lot. And that was our first shoot. And for me, that instantly kind of organized the film and all of the story threads that we would need to kind of follow through to the end. I see that Frankie's been dead for 12 years, and yet, Gordon, Stephen, you are, you are of all still... You are both still clearly deeply affected by his, by his absence in your life. Gordon, can you talk about, can you talk about the depression that you went into, as you tried to deal with the loss of this, 
great best pal of yours? Well, I, um, I can tell you that uh, uh, one thing, and that was at the, at the funeral home. And I remember just standing out by myself in front of the funeral home, and and, and it, it, it's, it hit me that uh, I'm I'm not never gonna laugh like uh, that again. The way Frank would make me laugh. Like he brought so much joy. He was a pain a lot of the times, but I think that comes with geniuses and, and artists like that. But his, his his wit and sense of humor was actually just uh, so influ influential on me. It was uh, I, I I never tired of it, and it, it was it was that it was a very deep feeling of loss that uh, that uh, this this one of a kind person is is now gone, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, you're not going to find anybody like him. Like, uh, there, 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 there's only one Frank Kerr on this earth. And there's something and, uh, so unfair about a guy who, who was the lead singer for a group dying of throat cancer. Yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, he, he, didn't, he didn't last too long after he was diagnosed. Well, let's and, play uh, another clip from the documentary, and, and we'll get a little more understanding of, of this issue. Go ahead, Sheldon. Let's play the next clip. You're a guitar player, you're a writer. We're in a band called Teenage Head, and I think that if we were able to get just a five, ten song demo, I think that would immensely make him a healthier, happier person. Best medicine. Part of me doesn't want to do it anymore at all. Steve, there are you guys all excited about getting the gang back together, and there is Gord clearly feeling something else. How tough was it for you to try to convince him that there was value in, in the music making him feel better? Oh, boy. Um, it, it's just... It just wasn't something I thought had to end when we lost Frank. It, it, it took a while. There was certainly a, a long period of grieving, and we knew there was going to be fan backlash if we tried to keep going without him. But uh, the songs that Gord has written, they're just, they're just so great, and the fan base has been so loyal that, uh, it, it, to me, it was just, we're, we're going, we're, we're doing this. We're, we're, we're ready, and... and uh, you know, I know you struggled through it, Gordy, but you you, you played amazing. You, 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 you just, you blow my mind sometimes with that guitar. <laughs> Thanks, Steve. <laughs> That's just some of what we covered this week on the agenda. For more, including the full conversations, you can visit our website, tvo.org, our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash the agenda, or our Twitter feed, twitter.com slash the agenda. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.